they want you to be in Star Wars. I said, oh, okay. What's the part? And he went, oh, God, and consulted his notes and said, it's called The Emperor of the Universe. So I said, well, I guess we'll be doing it then. <laughs> Welcome, friends and fans, to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And today, we are going back to the galaxy far, far away with our most imperious guest. So without further ado, let's move the ship from the asteroid field so that we can get a clear transmission. Our guest today is an Olivier and Tony award-winning actor and director whose body of work includes Dragon Slayer, Britannia, and an acclaimed stage performance in Faith Healer, and so much more. Today he joins us to discuss his career, as well as the rise, fall, and resurrection of Sheev Palpatine. Known to a select few as Darth Sidious, known to most as the Emperor, please welcome Mr. Ian McDermott. Hello, good to see you all, and a very good day from England. <laughs> and I'm not throaty, you know, so I'll have some more. Whoops. Oh, uh, Ian, looks like signal's a little bit uh, wishy-washy. Remember, we're still in the asteroid field. We can't get that clear signal. Oh, dear. Oh, uh, now he's frozen okay. up. All right, you're coming into... Uh, all right, you're a little clearer now. Okay. <laughs> all, right, you, all right, you're good now. Okay, Ian, hi, how are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm extremely well. Very pleased to be back in this unusual medium. Although, of course, it's intergalactic experiences are not exactly new to me. So here we are. Uh, this is very, very true. Well, Ian, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Uh, as always, uh, uh, the past 18 months or so, we've been unable to host you and guests like you in our physical stages. But we created this wonderful online forum, and we're so glad to have you on it. Our team right now is going through our chat room, pulling out questions for us. In the meantime, I, whenever I have a solo guest, I always like to start off with this. Um, what uh, drew you to becoming an actor? Oh, that's a long story. It was a long time ago. Um, I, did, I was at school, and in primary seven, when I must have been about well, 10 years old, um, they were holding, if you can actually use the word correctly in this context, auditions uh, for a tramp in a stage mime set to the tune of Waltzing Matilda, which is practically the Australian national anthem. Yes. And uh, I was a very shy kid, so I didn't know anything about acting or anything like that. And the teacher said, okay, hands up those who want to be seen for the part of the tram. And suddenly my hand shot up. It had nothing to do with me. I mean, it was almost like a Star Wars experience. And, uh, and then I went out and did it and uh, sat down again and then i this is probably indicative of how it went subsequently i saw all the other people doing it and i thought no i think i could do it better and they had no aspirations to be actors and neither had i at that time but i suppose that was the beginning of this little spark inside me so it wasn't re I, I i sort of felt that it was a decision already made for me i mean a lot of people feel like that about what they subsequently do that's just something that starts them off uh, and that was the day that started it off for me. Fantastic. So, so you uh, went to school uh, originally for uh, psychology, I believe, but the the acting bug yeah. was still entrenched within you. Well, I went to yes, I was I was too scared really. I was still a shy kid. I went to university because I had the right qualifications. Lucky me, and uh, and a lot of my pals were doing it, and they were doing psychology. Uh, so I joined in and I, you know, it's very interesting and I quite enjoyed it, but there was this yen always inside me to, to be an actor, but by and large kids from where I came from didn't do that sort of thing. Or if they did, they did it in an amateur way, you know, they didn't take it seriously as a career. Um, so I did that. But then when I got to my final year, I thought, no, this is crazy. I've got to try and do it. Otherwise I'll be unhappy for the rest of my life. So I scraped a degree. Uh, left college and then went to another college, the drama college in Glasgow. Uh, and that was the beginning of, of, of my journey into acting. Indeed. And uh, you'd already had a well-established career on stage. Uh, at what point uh, did Return of the Jedi uh, blip on your radar? Well, that came out of the blue. I just, uh, my agent called and said, George Lucas would like to see you. Now, you don't hear that every day, True. especially not especially not in London. I don't know, why would he want to see me? Because um, I knew that they were, you know, through friends, I knew they were shooting the movie, and I knew about the previous two movies, of course, I'd seen them. And, um, and so I thought, well, it's a bit late in the day to see someone to be in the movie, so 
I don't know, I'll go. And just as I was thinking all these thoughts, a car turned up just outside my front door and uh, I got in and before I knew where I was, I was down at the studio at Elstree, I think it was. And uh, there was George, it was a lunch break and Richard Marquand and they were very pleasant. I don't know what we chatted about. It wasn't anything important really. Maybe even the weather got help us. <laughs> and, uh, and as I was going out the door, 10 minutes, I thought, well, I got the chance to meet these people. That's great. Uh, and, and George said, hey, great nose. And I, he, he, he says he never said this, but I swear he did. So I thought, that's an unusual thing to say. Maybe that's a good yeah. idea, a good, you know, a promising sign. Anyway, I got home and immediately I walked through the door. The phone was ringing and my agent says, you've got the part. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah, I, really? talking about I said, no, 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 they like you. They want you to be in Star Wars. I said, oh, okay. What's the part? And he went, oh, God, and consulted his notes and said, it's called The Emperor of the Universe. So I said, well, I guess we'll be doing it then. And uh, you know the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it became this, uh, became became the icon to a generation and certainly to the, the, the Star yeah, Wars fans. Because I never imagined it was going to go on and on and on, you know, for which, of mm -hmm. course, I am very grateful and entirely delighted. Certainly right. Now, uh, I'm not sure if this was before or after, but uh, you did do a, uh, a scene stealing uh, part in Gorky, in Gorky Park, which I oh, yes. really enjoyed. Yes, that was around about the same time as as Return of the Jedi. Jedi, yes, in which I I played this guy who recreated people from their corpses yeah, in order yeah. that the investigation could lead to the person who had murdered them in the first place. Who turned out to be I'm not going to tell you in case you haven't seen Gorky Park. I have. But, but I have but <laughs> it's worth a watch. No, abs absolutely, a wonderful, wonderful cast in and of itself. So, uh, Jedi is done. Um, of course, for, for many, many years, people were asking Pe uh, Hector, uh, George Lucas, when are you going to do the prequels? When are you going to do the next movies or whatever? Uh, in the back of your head, were you always thinking, I wonder if I'm going to be involved in that? I No, I didn't even know there were going to be prequels, really, okay. until, uh, again, a friend of mine, an actor, who said, I think he was sworn to secrecy, I won't put his name, but he said, I've been filming something that's very unusual. It's a sort of series of test sequences. And we were out in somewhere very cold, I think it was Norway, and, uh, and George Lucas was there. Um, so I guess, although we were told nothing, you know, nothing ever changes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think he's working on something else to do with those Star Wars movies. Hmm. And, um, but I didn't think any more about it, but I got a call again um, from the casting director and uh, she said, well, uh, George is in town. <laughs> Do you want to come and meet him? So once again, the car arrived and uh, and I got in it. And it was a hotel this time. And uh, George was there. And I always say this, and I'm going to say it again, wearing the same shirt he wore in all those years ago. Very nice check shirt, of course, yeah. entirely <laughs> clean. Um, and said, hi, do you know anyone who'd like to play an emperor? I said, whoa. whoa, whoa. Funny you should say that. And he said, yeah, well, okay, cut to the chase. If you're interested, you know, we'd like you back. Uh, but it's very strange because it's not really what you might imagine. Because uh, Palpatine originally, of course, was just a human being like the rest of us, give me a break. Yeah. And he was, a, he was a politician, just an ordinary guy, and actually quite nice. And he was, uh, he worked very, you know, faithfully and hard for his queen. And pardon me, and uh, that's all we're going to see in the first movie. And then there's this other guy, uh, I'll just tell you a bit about the plot, so you tell me a bit about the plot, who's sort of in the background, and uh, he's manipulating everything, and uh, he really is the sort of villainous lead of the movie. So I thought, oh, I'd rather play that. You know? Anyway, of course, you know, I was very pleased <laughs> to be doing you know, Palpatine. And, stuff. and then I got the, this is true, I got the script, you know, and um, again, of course, there was no mention of characters opposite parts. It was just the script. And again, I thought this is a pretty good part. But I only got certain sections of it at that time. Later yeah. on, I got the full yeah. thing. Sure. And when I got the call sheet, I saw that my name was opposite this character called Darth Sidious, as well as Palpatine. So I thought, God, I can't believe that. You know, organizations are so careful, they're so cautious about not releasing things. They've made this gigantic mistake. So and then and then I thought, oh, maybe maybe they haven't. George, why didn't you tell me? You know, it was me. But that's typical. You know, it, it yeah. was it was good. It was mysterious. And then on the very first day, the very first shot, uh, it was Ray, uh, uh, you know, Darth Maul and me uh, in in our hooded presences. 
And uh, and I said, did you do you want me to do the voice? And George said, no, don't be ridiculous. It hasn't got there yet. So, so I, then I then I was putting two and two together and, and making making four almost. Uh, but once again, it was so unexpected and so exciting, and uh, and it was clear there were going to be more movies unless you know a terrible sort of disaster yeah. had occurred. And George was interested in making them for obvious reasons, but also because he was once again recreating, refounding, really, the whole business of the digital screen, of digital yeah. technology. Yeah. And he thought, as we go on, so I will find out more and more, and those films on that level, no, never mind on narrative level, character level, yeah. get yeah. more and more ambitious and more and more interesting, as it de they did, and I was lucky to be along for the ride. It did. He, it, it, I remember back after the conclusion of the original trilogy, he had always said that uh, he was waiting for technology, computer technology. To catch technology. up. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he said he wanted to literally wanted to say, I want to fill the screen with a thousand X-Wings and for it not to cost a billion dollars in model work. And yeah, stuff like yeah. That. And it was, I mean, alarmingly expensive. He kept, and that's why originally Yoda was going to be digitally created in, in the first in Phantom Menace, but it was too expensive. And it also, the technique wasn't as perfect as George yeah. would want it. So uh, good old Frank came back with the puppet, which we all loved anyway. So no uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you got to work with Frank on Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, another uh, film I that did, I adore. I did, I did. That was, that was, that was another great, uh, the, the auditions I've had, um, or non-auditions rather. Yes, I got a call from my agent. I was somewhere else in England. He said, come down. Uh, Frank Oz wants to meet you. I thought, oh, that's nice. What? Maybe dinner or something. No, 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 no. It's directly <laughs> movie, and uh, and he's got the great Steve Martin and the great Michael Caine, and um, the part is uh, Michael Caine sort of handyman. He does everything around the place. He looks after the drives all around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Looks after the with the emails and other emails and those things. Yes, I think they might be. So I went in, and uh, Frank said, uh, "You know, I'm so pleased you're here. Would you mind just doing a little bit with me? You know." Because you'll be up there with Michael and uh, Steve, and there won't be any time to rehearse, as usual. You know, you just yeah. so we we improvised, yeah. and we ended up killing ourselves la la with laughter. And uh, and he said, uh, "Yeah, I'd like you to come. Will you come?" So that's how Arthur happened. I think yeah. it was the next week or something else. I just rushed out. And uh, beautiful location. Yes, it was. It was Nice. Nothing nicer than Nice. And um, so, and we were there for, there for a while. And uh, and it was so so hot, and Steve was just delightful. It was also during the writers' strike, so certain lines came from certain quarters that perhaps they shouldn't have. But we were all, including me, very grateful for our thing in more than that. <laughs> Absolutely, you indeed. Have a little of this water now. Uh, go right in. <laughs> yeah, don't want your throat to be all. Don't want your voice to be all scratchy and gravelly. No, no, no we can't have that. Mm, he did it. <laughs> There we go. Back to back to some so, cool. Indeed. So, uh, uh, were you? Uh, what was your reaction, at least uh, for the first movie, when George said, "Oh, by the way, you don't have to do uh, prosthetics or any heavy makeup yet." Yes, he, he didn't actually say yet. He wouldn't have gone okay. that far. All right. Would okay. he? All right. But he I said, he said, he said, he said, no, no prosthetics. You know, just just the hood, and we we know we'll like you. And I I also wanted to say, and of course the nose does everything, you know, but uh, that was a sensitive subject by then. So so I did yes, but I I kind of missed the prosthetics. So I like the prosthetics. I was very pleased to get back to them uh, oh. in a certain recent movie that, uh, with again yeah, brilliant yeah. people making my face do what it did. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 again, again, absolutely, absolute kudos to you, and and my thanks to your, for your talents and your professionalism and your performance, especially through those uh, those the, that initial trilogy. Um, people have said that Palpatine could make an arguable case for being the protagonist of this of this of the of the first cycle of the Star Wars films. I suppose you could say that in a way, yes, he is the most evil thing ever. And we thought that was Darth Vader, didn't we? But, you know, here I am, even worse. Indeed, indeed. And, and again, the, the, the readings of Friends, I Love Democracy, that, that the obsequiousness yes, yes. of, of yes. Palpatine and yes. the ingratiation, and it's just enough to be a great politician that people would believe yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. And that was such a great line, actually. I mean, it's, you know, and that people quote it all the time now. And, and <laughs> also typical of George smuggling in those subtleties and being on the ball politically about what was happening back home and what might continue yeah. to happen. Who knows? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, up and down, up and down. And, uh, <laughs> and finally, uh, 
seven years later, I think you thought, uh, you know, you revisited the character occasionally in animation form and some uh, some gaming work. But then you got the email from J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Yes, that was, that was, I believe he introduced himself by email and apologized immediately. Because <laughs> he hadn't because he's so, you know, such a gentleman. And uh, I believed at this time. And he said, give me a number, I can call you on. So as fast as I could get the number back on the email, I did. And he called me and he said, and he was very straightforward. He said, we, we want you back. We want the emperor back. It makes complete logical sense to me. And he says, I think it will to everyone else. But he was behind it all along. And that the previous films of, um, of the sequels that people have seen, um, they knew there was something going on in the background that all of these evil characters were somehow being uh, recreated, remotivated, reworked by a hidden force. And he said, and of course, the logic is that the hidden force should be you. So that was even more exciting than the last one, because as you say, I realized then that throughout all nine movies, I was the motivating force of everything that's bad. Yeah. Um, and uh, and of course she um, she destroyed me absolutely. I think <laughs> watching watching that moment, I think he's not coming back after that. But of course he's still around, perhaps in, in other series. Who knows? You know, one way or another. Uh, I think probably with the makeup should it happen. But no, I'm not offering any clues because no one's approached me whatsoever. I've had right. no more crazy additions. But you'll be the first to know if I do. Fair. I uh, uh, appreciate that. Indeed, uh, I I think. Every time we've said, well, that's a wrap for uh, Palpatine, we've been wrong so far. So yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. we'll be wrong again, but either way, we look forward to it uh, in any form. And and again, I, I just, as a longtime Star Wars fan, on behalf of our audience too, just thank you again for what you brought to this character. Um, the, the performance, the villainy, the and, and just... Just making it so interesting to look at, to be interesting to that. You get you, every time he talk, he the character says one thing, but you can hear his thoughts as being yeah, something that's else. Good. And uh, to be perfectly fair to George, who wrote it all, of course, um, he, the, the script for Palpatine allowed him to do that. I mean, no, uh, no lesser in that great scene in, in the opera, which he only decided to set it there at the last minute because he could do one thing and think another quite easily there while pretending to watch the uh, the Squid Valley, I think, I yeah. think it was. Yeah. And so that was a very well-written scene, you know, right. in terms of pouring that poison into, into Anakin's ear. Yeah, it was very subtle. And also it, it sort of, you could see why he finally went, I mean, to do with Padme largely, but yeah. also to do with his inside feeling about ambition and power. Indeed. Absolutely. Indeed. Well, Ian, thank you so much for uh, indulging in my questions. I think we're going to go for audience questions. So okay. let's go ahead and yeah, let's go ahead and do our first one. And this first one comes from Randall and he wants to know if you rule the galaxy, what would be your first order of business? Well, of course, I'd have to cure the pandemic, wouldn't I? but there wouldn't be one in the galaxy. Probably um, there, would, there, would, there would be other things, but um I don't know. I would try and think, along the lines of the pandemic, what what is the sort of thing that could be best done for humanity? Uh, research that and then do it. <laughs> Absolutely works. Randall, thank you. Fun question. What do we have next? From Gabe in Brazil. Hmm. What is your favorite non-Star Wars role? Uh, that, I, that I've played myself? Um, yeah. Yes, I, there are so, so many, I just always say this, but one of my real favorites was being on Broadway in this play called Faith Healer, in which I played this uh, sweet, hopeless, failed, semi-alcoholic agent who went on the road with these two very close friends and he liked them more than they liked him. Um, the Faith Healer who pretended to cure and sometimes did, and his girlfriend who had a terrible time and with whom the um, character I played, who's called Teddy, was in love. Uh, and none of that was going anywhere. And it was, there was four, we tried to avoid saying the word at the time, because it sounds like a very boring evening, four monologues, but they're not. They all interconnect in surprising ways. And it was great to do that, first of all in Ireland, but most of all on Broadway. And we were all a bit nervous. Ray Fiennes played the, the, the Faith Hill, and Cherry Jones was his girlfriend. Uh, you know, two of the best actors in the world on stage and on screen. Uh, but we were still a bit nervous that it might be a lot for the audience to take. Well, we found the opposite. New York audiences, they, they, 
they, they just hang on every word, really. So, uh, so it was thrilling to do that and lovely to act in New York. I'd like to do it again one day. Mm -hmm. And that was the role that got you a Tony, correct? Yeah, yeah, lucky me. <laughs> no, it's not luck, it's something you earned. Well, you know, it's a bit of that, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Gabe, thank you. Wonderful question. What do we have next? Ah, from Lisa, number one Trek fan. She comes to a lot of our shows here. Who was the biggest? Yeah, who was the biggest influence in your career? It has to be another actor, really. Um, there was an actor, um, a wonderful actor, who acted in America sometimes on stage and in movies called John Wood, who was the, his great strength is he, he you always felt that he was making everything up as he went along where he wasn't of course he was entirely on text the whole time particularly in shakespeare so, so I, I i looked up to him as a kind of benchmark of how to do it and then in more recent years someone i had a good chance to work with on a television film which was great was the uh, great sir anthony hopkins who I, I think is is our best. Well, he's Wales' best, but he's certainly Britain's best too. And it was so thrilling to see him recently rewarded again for his performance in The Father, which I've yet to see. It's coming out soon in cinemas, and that's where I'm going to see it. So these are the two. Uh, absolutely fine. I'm I am a fan of of, of both. I'm a fan of John Wood, especially. Uh, he, he was just always well. I've never seen his theater work, but he was just always one of those actors that would pop up in roles and everybody else. I particularly liked him in McKellen's uh, Richard III as the yes, brother. Yes, yes. Really, yeah. really stole seeing he that. He did Richard III later on. It was marvelous too. Oh. Family nice. Lisa, thank you so much. Good to see you again. What do we have next? Here's over Christie. If Palpatine <laughs> could keep up with a villain from any other franchise or story or whatnot, who would it be? Hmm. I think he wouldn't team up. He's not a team player. That's, that's an easy answer, isn't it? Um, now he'd find something that wasn't quite human, surprise, surprise. Is there a is there a terrible villain that's just made of slime or something like that? It mm. would ooze out uh, of every pore when required. I can't uh, think of must be, mustn't that? There's, a, there's an evil tar pit in uh, Star Trek uh, uh, canon. Oh, okay. Well, I think I go for him. On the yeah. other hand, the one I like most, if I can just slide in, sure. uh, is the Joker in Batman. Um, he's, um, I, I mean, he's been wonderfully played by a whole series of actors. Yeah. Uh, and the great thing is, of course, he's not a joke. And uh, he's not a joke to himself. Either. You know, he's a mess, but a, a destructive mess. And occasionally an entertaining one. So I'm afraid that he and the Emperor would get on really well. Absolutely. I could totally see that in any of the Joker's forums. So anyway, Christy, thank you. Wonderful question. Uh, what do we have next? And here's one from Alex. Oh, do you enjoy directing or acting more? Uh, acting, certainly. And I don't really direct anymore. And when I used to run a theatre, particularly I made a theatre in London, uh, with another actor, then actor, Jonathan Kent, who's now a full-time director, um, I felt I sort of should direct as well as act, you know, that's what you do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I had a good time, by and large. But I, when we got into the theatre, it was great rehearsals, working with other actors, no problem. Loved working with the designers, the technical people, the lighting people, the musicians, all of that, seeing it come together and being a sort of chairman of all of that. But when I got in front of uh, the cast with an audience at the early previews, all my objective judgment went right out of the window. I just thought, my God, they've turned up, isn't that great? You know, God, they look so good in my costume. And, and this, this is no help to you if you're a director. And I go around and say, I hope not things. And they go, well, thanks. Good. I'm going to think that. Any, you know, advice or criticism? Oh, I, and I suddenly think, but I wasn't really paying attention. That's when I knew I wasn't a director. <laughs> and so uh, it was never, you know, it was again something I felt I should do. And it was all right up to a point. But it just can't compare with acting. And I suppose when those actors came on stage and I was sitting there with my pad and pen ready to take notes, I wanted to be up on stage with them. <laughs> and uh, so, so there we are. But my great friend, Jonathan Kent, who was co-director of the Armada with me, he was an actor then and was never, he was a very good actor, but he was never wholly happy doing it and found himself as a director. So that was gratifying for the theatre and gratifying for him. And now he's doing lots of things. He's got a movie coming up. Outstanding. So, Alex, thank you very much. Wonderful question. What do we have next? 
from Dante. Hmm. What is your favorite science fiction uh, television show, movie, and I'll add, uh, or, or book? Right. Well, I'm going to say something that's really cool. Star Trek, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that. But, uh, you know, we're supposed to be the great competitors on these Star Trek. <laughs> but I've never, I've never felt that. And also, um, because uh, I know, and we worked together at the Royal Shakespeare Company many years ago, Patrick Stewart very well. So, you know, that's, that, that would be the sort of the sort of thing, but um, I don't know. There are so many, aren't there? I like, I like, um, I like the recent Marvel franchise. I think that's wonderfully done, yeah. and it continues to be exciting. The way we hope Star Wars has been as well, you know. Yeah. Because uh, the writers, everybody involved, are always looking for surprising and different things to do with the characters, and and that's what makes a, a piece of art live. Ah, uh, indeed, <laughs> indeed, and. Yeah, in the in the old days of fandom, there was a, a stiff rivalry between Star Trek and Star Wars fans, but it's yeah. it's it's mellowed over the years. Yes, yes, I think it was fun too. You know, for yes. one, to pretend that they had nothing to do with the other. You know? yes. And every time someone said mistakenly to me, "I love your work in Star Trek," you know, I would give them a kind of look that the Emperor might give to something. But then I'd laugh and say it was a joke. Which you want? Hey, there you go, Dante. Thank you. Fun question. Uh, what do we have next? Here's one from Connor. Uh, have you ever had any input on uh, the character of Palpatine throughout the years? Quite a lot, really. I mean, the great thing about George is that um, he spends a lot of time casting, getting who he thinks is the right person for the role, and then he lets them get on with it, and he expects that they will do that, having seen in them the potential that he saw in the first place. So I had a, a, a considerable degree of, of freedom within the parameters of the makeup and all the rest of it. And in Return of the Jedi, uh, of course, the Emperor had appeared, as everyone knows, in the previous movie, The Empire Strikes Back. And um, of course, he wasn't fully identified as a character, but he did have Clive Revel's voice, the great Clive Revel, to whom I pay enormous respect as a stage actor and as somebody who's been in a lot of movies. Um, so, and I also felt a little bit guilty, you know, I, I see him occasionally at conventions, you know, and he spits at me. He doesn't at all. No, he's very charming. <laughs> <laughs> very charming back. Um, but given the fact that that was how the emperor was first presented, that there were, I suppose there were many choices, but George hadn't really thought that through, nor had Richard Mark when he directed the movie. They imagined that I would sort of sound a bit like Ty Revel, and maybe if I didn't, they would have invited Ty back to have no evidence of it to do the role. Uh, but when I saw the makeup and the costume and stuff, I thought, well, he does look like this terrible, like a slime again, slimy toad. And so he probably, if Clive had seen all that, I'm sure he would have altered his voice too. So I said, I, I, I think he should sound a bit like he looks. And so, you know, they all said, show us what you mean. And so I, I just found that voice from somewhere down there and, uh, and did it. And no, and no one said stop. And yeah, I did movies when film says, "What are you doing?" Or uh, "We're going on, and we don't want any of that." Thank you. You know, you think oh, I mean, too far, so good. And then anyway, I completed the whole movie doing that. But I knew most things in those days had to be revoiced because the sound wasn't as advanced as it is now. Digital sound didn't exist, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so there were so many channels going on at once. So I knew I would be going back, and I to uh, to revoice. And I was there at the studio in the story in South Audley Street with George and Steven Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy, who I met for the first time. Wow. And uh, George said, I want to be two friends of mine. Oh, God, 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 my voice again. For the best man, I'm doing it from George and seeing myself for the first time. You know, the way anyway, they couldn't have been more charming. And uh, and I wondered also if he got on along to see if what I was doing was, was maybe going to work. I don't know, no evidence, but... Anyway, they couldn't. Do it. And when I started off uh, with with the voice, and uh, and particularly when I did the laugh, <laughs> that sort of thing, George uh, wasn't George. No, Stephen said, "Oh my God, you're evil!" So I, I reckon he clinched it. If it hadn't clinched it before, and then we all went uh, out to lunch for a hamburger around the corner. It was a great day. <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, history definitely said, like, yeah, that that's that'll do it. Yeah, and also <laughs> we had this joke in um, just to, to go on a bit um, in um, the 
the last of the, the sequels of Revenge, uh, Revenge of the Jedi, uh, that when George reset the scene, which was going to be in an office in the opera house, that I would be able to say when people asked, maybe I'm going to preempt a question, I'm not, is there anything good about this character? I would say, yes, he goes to the theatre. So that was that was a sheer joke. And in fact, it was it was the ballet, which I think I only later discovered, like the rest of us, because we we're watching anything. You know, there were two cameras and a bit of green screen behind us, yeah. and we were pretending yeah. as, as we not infrequently do. And uh, and later on, uh, George confessed it was going to be a squid ballet, and indeed it was. And they're very talented, these squids. I wonder what they've been doing in lockdown. Oh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's always been a, a fan theory to wonder what Palpatine did in his downtime. And for, in my own head canon, I've always said, I think he's a patron of the arts. I think despite yeah. his evil nature, I think he appreciates art. And I think it's, it's beyond his morality. I think he probably does. Probably a particular kind of art. I mean, apart from all from the squid valley, it's probably the kind yes, of exactly. art that Hitler enjoyed. You know? mm. Not what the kind of art that probably really want a lot of good yeah. things. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, we're waiting for that backstory uh, at the height of Palpatine's power when, uh, and now it's seven o'clock time for a mandatory viewing of Squid Ballet. I think they could go far. Maybe they have gone far. Maybe I'm just out of time. <laughs> zooming away, you know, I'm sure. Just search. You'll probably find it. Hey, let's go ahead and roll another one. Thank you again, Connor. Fun one. Here's one of Eric. Oh, what was your favorite behind the scenes moment from Star Wars? I suppose, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to pay tribute to him. It was a moment with Dave, Dave Prowse. Uh, again, it was a it was a humorous moment. And uh, of course, my first day on set in Return of the Jedi, there's no time to introduce, be introduced, to introduce to anyone. I and mean, you, of course, Dave was a very tall person, and that his voice was not going to be his. <clears throat> it was going to be the great James L. Jones, and he knew that, so there was no mystery about it. But I, I didn't know that when I came down those steps out of the shuttle at the beginning and saw him for the first time. It was it was a rehearsal which later became a take. Um, that I wouldn't be able to hear him because they, they didn't magnify his voice and he was way up there. So I just had to guess when he finished speaking. Also, also think in my mind that how James might be going to do it later when he was recording it. Right. That was our first encounter, but that wasn't the thing that, that was most memorable. Um, it was a lot Encounter on film, although I saw him a few times after that, I would say. Uh, when Palpatine was apparently killed, he wasn't, as we all know, uh, when he was put down that sh terrible shuttle and maimed horribly um, before he could, you know, get the best scientists in the world to put him together again, and we all know who they are, um, I had to be thrown down that ship. And in order to maybe go down, I had to be wedged up. So they, that's what they do. They wish you up and then they reverse the shot. It's very, very simple. It's a very peculiar thing to, to, to do. But that's <laughs> all, all Dave had to do was to catch my ankles as he went like that, you know, and he just sort of, but he was, you know, he's very tall. He was in the suit. He couldn't see a face. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to end up, or well, every take, swinging around the studio for ages. And, you know, I really enjoyed it. I thought I, I could do a bit more of this fly. Um, so we, uh, when we did meet each other, we, we, we would reminisce about the amazing moment when he didn't catch me as I went up to go down. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, that, oops, I think was probably the expression most used that day. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, gracious. Uh, practical effects. <laughs> yeah. Eric, thank you so much. It was a great question. Hey, what's next? Here we have one from Lynn. Hmm. Uh, well, do you have any uh, Star Wars memorabilia? And if so, what is uh, your favorite? I don't. I don't own any of it. I give it away, or I'm, I'm happy to sign it. Um, um, I suppose I, the, the things I like most that occasionally friends of mine have, and, and actually I wear one as pajamas. This is really intimate. I'm giving away a secret. Uh, it's things with, and don't send them, please. The things, the things with Sith on it. I just like that. I like that word, you know. And it's just, you know, if you if you can, if I have a few t-shirts, and sometimes not not in the street, of course, that would be grotesquely embarrassing. But occasionally, if a friend comes out, I put on a Sith t-shirt. 
so that's uh, that's what I feel really close to. But no, I, I don't have, have any models or uh, I have a few, you know, photographs that I sign now and again and, and photographs of the movies with friends. These are my sure. memorabilia, you know, Mark and Carrie and so on. So these are, these are the nice things to keep. But as far as the models of the emperor are concerned, I'll leave that to you guys. <laughs> uh, there are plenty of people to do that for you. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Lynn, thank you very much. Great question. Ed, here's one from Lisa. Oh, uh, what was your reaction to the original Star Wars? I uh, I saw it and I, I felt, oh, the way George had always described it, it was like one of those matinee serials that I'd, I'd grown up with as a kid. It had the same kind of swashbuckling excitement. Uh, although this was sci-fi, this was a different universe. But, you know, it had heroes and villains and a whole series of unexpected incidents followed each other and you couldn't wait to feel what was going to happen next hence the prequels and so on but of course i, I had no idea that peter cushing would be talking about me and that retrospective is a great thing because he was a marvelous actor unfortunately i never got to meet him i got to meet and work with as you know his great friend christopher lee so i learned a lot yeah. about him. but the idea that he was the emperor's sort of vicar on earth was, was was very appealing, but it is. I mean, lots of people say this about parts of the subsequent play. So you go along, you know, see a movie or something with some friends. It's just a night out, and later on, you find that you're actually in it <laughs> for all, that, all those years, and you never knew until it yeah. exploded in the form of a contract. There you go. And uh, uh, what uh, what was it like with uh, with Christopher Lee? I'm a as a as a sci-fi and a horror buff, I'm a huge fan of his, so I've always been curious. Yes, uh, me too. I, I could easily have mentioned him when that good question about the two most actors in the country. Um, I, I saw him in lots of things, obviously Dracula. And um, there's a great film called The Devil Rides Out. And I was always very, very impressed by, by his acting. Again, he is someone who, uh, who was extremely good at conveying what's go, what goes on behind the eye. And he almost made Dracula into a tragic character, I think, which is, you know, that's not easy to do. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> what Dracula does. He had this great sort of gravitas about him. Uh, and as a person, he was wholly delightful. He was, he would say that he was actually a frustrated opera singer. He had this wonderful bass voice. Yeah. And we, uh, on one of the sets, we had adjoining dressing rooms. And uh, early in the morning, I would hear him sing excerpts from Boris Goodenough, not no mean opera to start the day with and uh, he said yeah yes that is where my true passion lies but um also love making movies and he was a he was a master swordsman and yes, he, was. Uh, he was of course of a certain age when we did the last movie so he couldn't be as agile as he once was but he was very admiring of hayden and ewan who are also master swordsmen and um and you do see that in the movies but as you know in the movies it's all edited tricked out and so on you don't quite realize how brilliant they were and uh, i gather they might get a chance to do it again so if yeah. you do happen to be watching that uh, new series that's being made at the moment uh, watch those fights very closely because i'm sure they'll be doing some more uh, and it'll be all them and they will be just as brilliant uh, now as they were then that i have no doubt of uh, lisa thank you wonderful question what do we have next here's one from matthew Hmm. Do you believe in an intelligent life on other planets? Oh, you know, I'd love to. Wouldn't we all? Yeah. And when that, that thing landed on Mars, it was so versatile. So many things. You know. It all seemed like a walk of the park, didn't it? I mean, so yeah. many, many, millions of miles away. But uh, I, know, I know they're testing for um, uh, signs of human life in previous ages, but... Uh, I think they feel they convinced that there isn't any of it at the moment, but maybe other planets will 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 have some. It's just odd to think it's only us out there in the vast universe. You know, you think there has to be somebody else who's, who's making a mess of things. Sorry, who's yeah. <laughs> doing it right? But anyway, I I hope so, but I I I can't believe it at the moment. Fair, absolutely fair, Matthew. Thank you. And I think we have time for one or two more. What do we have next? From Val. How does it feel playing evil? I'll put it that way. Really, that. really good. Yeah. No, it's fun. I mean, I have to say this. It is. It's, it's fun playing the bad guy. I don't quite know why. It's perverted to say that, doesn't it? 
but it's because uh, these plants are usually meaty you know they, they usually have and as, as we were saying earlier it's, it's always very nice to play someone who isn't i mean it's not much doubt about the emperor but there, there was a lot of doubt about palpatine i mean if we started if george had started the whole movies with that film it would be very interesting to see if people had any inkling that this you know apparently straightforward not very interesting guy suddenly turned out to be this uh, evil mastermind and it gives you it gives you a certain power on set because people you know they're not stupid they're not scared of you I mean, i'm just here you know it, I'm not, not, nothing terrifying about me but when you're playing the character when you do the voice there's a sort of when we when i didn't go back to to do the last movie um there was, there was a scene which was inevitably going to be you know truncated cut short a bit the very opening scene um with um my, he didn't know it at the time, he was the guy who was working for me all those years. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, my voice, first of all, arrived into the scene, as it did in the movie, but there was more to be said originally, uh, just as a voice. And we were in this vast studio, huge hangar uh, down at uh, Pinewood. And um, because um, I, I only had to do the work to begin with, as they were lighting, and Adam was walking through, um, you know, and the awful premises of this, you know, this strange, evil hospital. Um, and all I had to do was talk to him on what they call the God mic, which is a microphone, which has enormous reverberation all over the studio. Um, and I think the, the, the first line uh, in the film is, at last. So and that wasn't the first line we did in the studio. It sort of, many lines came and went, as, as they always do in movies, in the editing and so on. But when I, let's say it was at last, when that happened, I could I could actually feel, and of course, that was being Star Wars. A lot of people in the studio, you know, apart from, the, I think the cinematographer must have known, but there were so many people, you know, they get the script that day and they, they're not quite, you know, they're very busy. Uh, you know, the grips and all these other guys have got so many things to think about. They didn't really know I was coming back. And, you know, we weren't advertising it. No, yeah. And you know, that was that was extraordinary. There was a real a real sort of free song in, in the studio. I like to think the free song that Palpatine may have created um, to... Um, to his to to Adam to Ray. but um, it was exciting and also it was it was good to be able to do that voice on a marvelous Echo God mic. It was like speaking to the to the universe, and then of course you know we did it with ordinary mics after that. Yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, that was a great great moment I think for, for, for everybody, certainly for you know the Star Wars fans in the studio. <laughs> and the Star Wars fans around the world as well. We saw the final I hope, product. I hope so. Yes, yes. I, 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 we all hope they wouldn't think, "Oh Christ, not him again." You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, he's dead. He should be dead. You know, you know. Uh, I thought, I thought it was. I thought, Palpatine is very hard to kill. Palpatine, and of no, course, I, it was horrible, mangled and injured. You know, thanks to Dave not catching me that day. <laughs> Long, long ago but he did he did know you know how to get hold of the best scientists you know and they're around and had himself slowly but imperfectly uh, recreated over the years but he couldn't get by without the help of a vast machine you know so um, until he got his power back in the way we all know which was a subtle thing that not even he realized was going to happen Absolutely, indeed. No, uh, it was, our reaction was not him again. Our reaction was, finally, it's about time. Oh, well, well, that's good. Yes, okay. I'll take <laughs> it. Ian, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for joining us on the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Any final words for our audience before we go? A great, a great pleasure for me. Uh, nice to be back in human form. Um, I know we've all been cut off lately, uh, and... Uh, when you play an emperor, you know, the character is always cut off because he doesn't, he's not interested in anybody else, never mind not getting out very much in, in the last film. So um, it's nice to be back with you in this form. Um, and we in London have just, as you in America are beginning to go, which is great. We're just being slowly allowed out and we're all being very cautious and not doing anything stupid and being vaccinated. Yes, Palpatine has got two vaccines and he recommends it to everybody as soon as possible. Um, so um, that's that's the best thing, and it's but it's very nice to be able to speak to you through this medium, which initially made me uh, quite nervous. I'm not a great zoomer, 
I, you know, if people want to get in contact and you can't go outside, I'd say, well, there's, there's the phone, you know. <laughs> but uh, I've really rather enjoyed it. So m maybe it'll catch on. Thank well, you. thank I am so glad we were able to make it palatable for you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, glad to see you in good spirit and in absolutely good health. And Ian, it's been my absolute pleasure to serve you today and our audience. And to our audience, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for your great questions. Hope to see you all again soon. Until then, bye-bye, everyone. Take care, and please keep looking up.